Concerning is the limited proportion of funding that actually reach, reaches developing nations and supports locally led initiatives. And I think we believe that inclusive finance can bolster the resilience of communities most affected by climate change, and it can support their autonomous adaptation strategies and indeed be catalytic for executing planned actions. But conversations about promoting locally led adaptation and how inclusive financial services can best support them are still at their early stages. Current adaptation methods do not fully leverage the potential of financial services to enhance resilience to climate change. And sim simultaneously, the world of inclusive finance has not really begun to incorporate climate change challenges and vulnerabilities into its strategies and offerings. So the objective of this uh, webinar is to highlight the importance of locally led adaptation and the role that financial services must play to support it. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome um, people from three different organizations that are at the cutting edge of this, uh, of this uh, effort to bring together climate expertise and financial uh, services expertise. From MSC, we have Arjun Dixit, who leads uh, Microsave's um, climate and uh, uh, sustainability practice. From ICAD, we have uh, Professor Mizan Rama uh, Khan, who is an outstanding uh, world-recognized expert on uh, financing for climate change uh, adaptation and resilience. And from CGAP, we have Sylvia Bauer, who um, has led some fascinating work on what um, financial service providers should be doing in the context of climate change. I hope that by the end of the webinar, you will have had insights and inspiration from the front line on climate change from Bangladesh, India and Nigeria. I hope that by the end, you will also understand the importance of locally led approaches to building the resilience of the most vulnerable people, and that you will appreciate the role that inclusive financial services can play in advancing climate resilience. And then finally, hopefully, you'll have increased understanding of the synergies between programming and investments in financial inclusion and climate change. The private sector's role in adaptation financing goes overlooked. And with support of the big funds and blended finance combining public and private investments, there is a great opportunity to significantly increase the finance available and to get closer to the nearly 400 billion uh, US dollars a year required for adaptation around the globe. With those preliminary thoughts, I'd like to hand over to Arjan. And Arjun, if you would like to share your screen, we look forward to hearing from you about your experiences from the front line. Arjun, we can't hear you. Uh, I was on, on, on mute. I'm sorry. Can I just confirm that you're able to view my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. Great. Yes. Thank you so much, Graham. My name is Arjun. I um, uh, co-lead our mm -hmm. practice at MSC on climate change and sustainability and very sort of happy to be here. I'm going to speak today a little bit about some of our findings from work that we've done in Bangladesh, Nigeria. Uh, and India, some by ourselves and some in partnership with uh, with uh, colleagues uh, and in support with CGAP. Um, and we're going to speak a little bit about you know innovation and in inclusive finance and why it's necessary uh, to build resilience of uh, the poor and vulnerable. Um, I'll just start a little bit by giving you an overview of the flow of this particular presentation. I'll start with talking about some of our background and context of how we set up our research. Uh, <laughs> 
I'll speak to you about some of our findings on the impacts of various extreme weather events, as well as slow onset climate related events. Uh, we'll share some of the uh, coping and sort of adaptation strategies that we were able to identify across these different geographies and speak to you about um, some of the limitations um, in the current offering of financial services, uh, in particular in how uh, people living in poverty are currently using um, these services in response to these climate hazards. Um, so we know that you know climate change is significantly impacting lives and livelihoods, particularly of those on the front lines. The intensity and frequency of hazards of slow onset events is increasing, and we're already seeing significant impacts. Um, but the inclusive financial products uh, that are currently available don't seem to be suitable um, enough to strengthen people's resilience. So we really wanted to identify what evidence exists um, um, and, and what are the, some of the gaps and opportunities for solving this particular problem. Uh, and so we set, around, uh, set about answering this in partnership with uh, our colleagues in an organization called Decodis uh, and with support from, from CGAP um, in Bangladesh, in Nigeria, and in uh, India. And we primarily sort of asked uh, a number of different questions, but uh, they were around, you know, identifying the impacts, both direct and in indirect, from climate risks. Um, the current uh, mapping of current coping strategies that people are using, uh, people that are sort of most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, are using to respond and recover from these hazards. Um, we wanted to identify the role of uh, formal and both informal and formal financial services and how they're impacting people's resilience. Um, and then we wanted to identify some gaps, some challenges and, and barriers around sort of the use of these products and services in these different geographies. So just to give you a brief overview of where we did this work, um, there were four specific places um, where we conducted primary research. Uh, we did primary research in Southwest coastal Bangladesh around Kulna and Shatkira. Uh, we did primary research <clears throat> in um, South uh, uh, and Sub-Saharan North Nigeria in places called Ningu, Kano, and Katsina. We did work in the Gangetic floodplains of, of Bihar in Northern India. And we did some work in uh, Delhi around the national capital region, uh, primarily, primarily looking at a number of different climate hazards. So we looked at cyclones, mm -hmm. soil salinity, and coastal flooding in Bangladesh. We looked at pluvial flooding, drought, and the presence of diseases and pests in, Bang in uh, Bihar. Uh, we looked at drought uh, and disease and pests and uh, rainfall variability in um, Nigeria. And we looked at extreme heat um, and the impact of extreme heat in, in the northern, uh, in the national capital region in Delhi. And, and the livelihoods that we focused on were subsistence smallholder farmers, primarily engaged in rice farming in Bangladesh and India, and in cassava and goat farming in Nigeria. We looked at informal laborers, uh, MSME workers in, um, in uh, India, uh, and we looked at petty traders that were doing micro or nano enterprises in Bangladesh. Um, and in terms of, of the climate hazard, since this is, you know, uh, we're speaking primarily to a climate crowd, you know, this, this shouldn't come as a, um, a surprise, but the nature of, of uh, the impacts is different based on the kinds of hazards that you're facing, right? So, uh, <clears throat> you know, the 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 uh, the the impacts are already felt. Uh, they're already being, um, you know, significantly impacting people's lives uh, and livelihoods across, you know, all these different geographies from hazards such as cyclones, from changing variability in rainfall patterns, from floods from heat uh, and in places like coastal Bangladesh from increasing soil salinity from coastal flooding and, and sort of, you know, rising sea level. <clears throat> and of course the impact on women um, tends to be disproportionate uh, because of uh, different social norms, uh, because of lack of access and control over productive resources, lack of decision-making power. So the burden on women particularly around unpaid work, increased um, household debt burden, 
sort of you know nutritional impacts on families and women in particular, safety and security concerns uh, from um, you know <clears throat> having to uh, be displaced uh, during sort of extreme events. Those are quite sort of significant. Um, for example, in in Bihar, uh, we found out that um, you know the primary research revealed that flooding, in particular, pluvial flooding. Uh, from from the Himalayan rivers that flow into Bihar is quite significant, and the impact that it's having on farming livelihoods across the state is quite significant. Um, and that when you talk to people, um, <laughs> their perception over the years is that um, you know the the disruption that flooding is causing on their livelihoods has been significantly rising in, in comparison to other sort of hazards. Also, flooding is rising, and linked to that. Is the fact that you know increased flooding, increased heat and humidity is also um, leading to an increased infestation of pests and attacks by pests on on farming crops. Um, so that's sort of quite significant across Bihar. Um, in uh, in sort of southwestern Shatkira and Bangladesh, um, this is just a schematic of the impact of various climate related events on a seasonal cropping cycle uh, in 2020 when cyclone amphan impacted southwest bangladesh in the month of november uh, <clears throat> but you can see that from the month of june to the end of Je of february when the aman rice cultivation season is in bangladesh um you know uh, cropping systems face significant and uh, repeated challenges from various different hazards, including from extreme heat and increasing salinity during land preparation, but also from erratic rainfall and delayed onset of monsoon, um, increasing sort of erratic uh, high volume rainfall that keeps flooded fields flooded when they shouldn't be, um, increasing attacks on pesticides, and then in the months of November, uh, for example, um, when the, it's harvesting season, cyclone, and it's also cyclone season, um, standing crops can get very, very se severely impacted um, by these activities. So across the board from, from June to February, the impact of various climate hazards on, on cropping systems, uh, rice cropping systems in this particular case can be quite significant. Um, Similarly, um, in Nigeria, uh, we found that over the course of the last 40 years or so, there's been a significant decrease um, across the five sort of major um, capitals that form the core foundational building blocks of adaptive capacity. Uh, if you look at physical capital and you look at things like water access, we see that water access has decreased in the places that we were researching in Nigeria. Um, land depletion, primarily due to, sell it, due to selling off of land is quite common. Uh, people are making less income over the years um, compared to 40 years ago than they are now. Uh, <clears throat> there seems to be less people within the community who are able to save and borrow within themselves. So covariant sort of credit risk across the, across the areas that we were looking at. Um, is also decreasing, and and there's also we also identified sort of a, uh, a a decrease in both the the quantity and and quality of calories that people were eating, uh, that it's both less food and less quality food um, that people sort of have access to across uh, you know the three specific areas um, that we saw in in Nigeria, uh, and and also in in um, in uh, northwest, uh, in uh, the capital region of India, where we're looking at impact of extreme heat, um, you know there are there are um, <clears throat> some studies that say that South Asia will be unlivable because of rising humidity and rising heat, and we're already starting to see impacts of of extreme heat on people that are working in the informal sector. This is a picture of uh, somebody called Hima, who's forty three years old, who moved. To to Delhi from Bihar, uh, and she's already, you know, experiencing um, issues related to extreme heat, such as dizziness, vomiting, diarrhea, weakness, um, and high fever. 
um, and that's leading to escalating healthcare costs, uh, which cause sort of major financial burdens on on people, particularly migrant, informal workers. Uh, so the the financial vulnerability is increasing. Um, access to healthcare, even though public healthcare in India is available. Um, access may be a challenge. Uh, it might be difficult. They might not have time from their work, their employers to go to far away public hospitals. So there is still a burden that people face because they they tend to sort of go to private clinics or private um, pharmacies to get access to these medicines. And here the the private sector's role, in particular, helping uh, employers provide different kinds of health and and productivity related insurance could be quite important, but we found no evidence of these kinds of, of uh, products or services that exist uh, in the regions that we were studying in in, uh, in the capital uh, of India. Um, so, so given those impacts, um, you know, we did find a range of different coping mechanisms, which should also be familiar to you. Um, but, but in general, uh, the coping mechanisms that we were able to identify that people were already using don't seem to be up to the challenge to meet the needs um, of you know, a, a changing world that's under a climate emergency, for example. Uh, people, because of investments in disaster risk reduction in places like Bangladesh, um, loss of life with respect to sort of cyclones is less. Uh, people are able to relocate uh, but you know they're still sort of waiting on um, relief, or humanitarian re relief, or sort of falling back on credit uh, and borrowing from informal sources to smooth consumption after a particular event. Um, we did find some instances of people sort of moving away from rice cultivation towards um, vegetable farming or homestead gardening in places like Bangladesh and India, uh, but they're not at the scale that's required. Um, there's also, you know, people are applying sugar uh, and lime uh, to neutralize soil salinity in places like Bangladesh. Migration, uh, permanent migration to cities is an important adaptive strategy, uh, but seasonal migration, sharecropping, uh, you know, sort of diversifying your crops um, to fishing or other sources of cash crops um, as an income diversification strategy. Uh, we did find some instances of people sort of engaging in these kinds of activities, but but in general, uh, people that are suffering that are at the front lines have to resort to lots of negative coping strategies, you know, of things such as eating less, of having to distress sell their assets, or of having to sort of migrate and move away from their sources of, of livelihood and belonging uh, to other areas. Um, so, you know, given sort of these kinds of coping strategies, we try to identify what are some of the ways that financial services are being used. Um, in Bangladesh, uh, we know that microfinance um, is quite ubiquitous and is, is readily available. So the role that it plays that we found, particularly in sort of risk absorption, uh, consumption smoothing, smoothing activities immediately after a disaster is quite positive that microfinance is available, that people are using it. Um, and the same for informal sources of credit. They're flexible, readily available, and people do use it. Um, but the role of, um, you know, these kinds of uh, financial products and services across sort of disaster risk reduction, across risk absorption, across risk transfer um, was not significantly strong. And in one case, uh, particularly around sort of using savings deposits for uh, responding to the needs immediately after a disaster from microfinance institutions. Sometimes it's negative because microfinance institutions, not all of them, but some of them don't allow people to withdraw their savings. Uh, and if you withdraw the savings, you're not member, you, you lose your membership. Uh, so sometimes these relationships are, are negative. Uh, but microfinance um, and specifically credit from microfinance NGOs, uh, continues to be a, a large source uh, of what people use, particularly after a disaster. Uh, but uh, mobile, uh, we did find instances of people using uh, mobile wallet money, um, savings deposits uh, with uh, microfinance, but also with you know various sort of other um, uh, uh, commercial financial institutions. There are some instances of takaful insurance in Bangladesh. 
Uh, in contrast, in Nigeria, the use of financial services uh, is quite low. We didn't find lots of instances of people using formal loans or digital lending or even insurance. And, and the most used tool and, and most tools that people said were most useful to them to respond to disasters and, and climate related events were informal tools such as informal loans or um, you know the, the rotating savings and credit associations or VSLAs. Um, and also something we found was something called master-based lending, where sort of to get around uh, rules around, you know, um, Islamic financing, uh, people, uh, you know, start businesses with a particular mentor from a, a, in a particular sector, and that mentor provides uh, funding for starting that business in the hope of getting gratuity later on. Um, so, so those there, there are increasing. Um, there are lots of uses of of informal. Uh, tools, um, but the use of formal tools in in the places that we were looking in Nigeria were quite absent. Um, and and also maybe important was that it was the non-financial strategies and tools that seemed to be much more important to people than financial tools by themselves. Um, in Bihar, uh, the the condition was a little bit similar to what we found in in Bangladesh, right? People do have access to microfinance loans. People do have access to self-help group loans. Uh, we did find instances of government transfers, humanitarian response and social protection sort of payments, G2B payments from governments. Uh, and, and most of these tend to be sort of targeted in Bihar uh, towards women. Um, the use of, of money lenders and informal lenders was primarily sort of men. Um, uh, and we didn't find any instances of uh, sort of crop insurance or livestock insurance in the instances that we were looking at. Um, some some uh, some evidence of multi-parallel crop insurance and loans from banks for income smoothing, but that was about it. Um, so so given sort of these challenges um, <clears throat> in terms of how current financial products and services are being used to build resilience, it it does seem to us that there's a there's a strong need. Um, to support microfinance institutions, inclusive financial institutions, to be able to serve um, the needs of, of, you know, the most vulnerable in, in a stronger way. And we think that blended finance instruments could probably play a very strong role in helping microfinance institutions and other inclusive financial institutions sort of play that role and provide these services. Um, there are three primarily roles that, uh, you know, the blending of, of, uh, both public and, and private finance could play in terms of increasing, um, you know, the reach of uh, commercial players like my, my microfinance institutions. It could reduce the average cost of capital. It could reduce their risk, and it could allow for blended uh, financial leverage. And there are a number of different financial instruments that are available that can uh, help with many of these sort of strategies. Um, and, and it's high time that we start thinking about how we uh, use um, some of these uh, financial instruments um, that have been used in other sectors already to sort of increase uh, adoption and scale of, um, you know, decarbonization or, um, you know, adoption of various sort of renewable energy practices that we start using these to build a case for resilience and for ensuring that you know we're providing the financial services um, and products that people need to be able to respond to the challenges that they're facing um, in in the front lines uh, of the of of climate change. So thank you so much. Super, thank you so much, uh, Arjun. Um, a great summary. And uh, with that, I would like to invite uh, Professor Mizan Khan to share his thoughts and experiences um, from working uh, on these, these topics uh, for, for many years. Mizambai, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you. As, uh, as we agreed, I will focus first on the international scene as a climate uh, finance negotiator for long years with the Bangladesh delegation. Okay. So let me first start with the number uh, that uh, Graham, you have mentioned about $30 billion of adaptation finance uh, 
uh, yearly uh, delivered to developing countries. But the uh, G77 countries, that is developing countries, don't accept this figure, you know, because they believe more in the figure of Oxfam. Uh, this is a figure kind of from the CPI and the OECD, about $83.6 billion, for example, uh, in 2020, they have delivered. Uh, and out of that, around this figure, about $24, $25 billion, they call it as adaptation finance. But Ox, Oxfam deflates this figure down uh, at least by three times uh, because there is double, triple counting. And also uh, the uh, money uh, is uh, taken at face value of loans, not as its grant equivalence. So because of these two reasons, usually the OECD figure is inflated. And they have an interest to show inflated figure of adaptation or mitigation finance, because under, uh, under the climate regime, climate convention and the Paris Agreement, they are obligated legally to support developing countries with the language shall provide. Okay, not should, should is recommendatory. So uh, in global perspective, I will mention just two, three bullet points. One is 80 versus 20, these two figures relate to two areas. 80% goes for mitigation and 20% for adaptation. Then again, 80% goes for uh, as loans and 20% for grants. Okay, overall in the global south, but even for the low-income countries, LDCs, about 71% of uh, climate finance uh, is delivered as loans. Okay, this is double uh, injustice. Uh, which adds to their climate uh, debt. Okay, uh, uh, already more than 50% uh, of low-income countries are in debt distress. And, and the next injustice in climate finance, even adaptation finance is about 55% of uh, climate finance delivered to the LDCs uh, is, goes for mitigation, not for adaptation, but for the low-income countries, which are nano-emitters, I call it in my book. I have used this word nano-emitters. Uh, adaptation is the utmost priority. But so the donor agenda kind of is served through this climate finance. Again, there is another injustice. The more and more of ODA, overseas development assistance, or what we call foreign aid, the mission whose mission is to support the provision of uh, uh, SDGs, achievement of realization of SDGs in the low income countries, but more and more ODA is delivered as climate finance. Okay, now what happens? Uh, this uh, ODA climate finance goes more to uh, middle income developing countries because uh, they claim more ODA. Uh, in terms of both mitigation also. And so adapt, uh, LDC countries lose out. For example, in 2022 and even 23, they had less ODA uh, flown to, uh, uh, in flow uh, to the LDCs than uh, previous years. So these are the global figures that I wanted to uh, share first. Now let me go as uh, we have agreed to uh, share my thoughts about some multilateral agencies and what is their profile in terms of uh, uh, local level uh, financing. So let me, chronologically, if we go, then uh, global environment facility, let us uh, look at some kind of parameters, figures. Uh, GEF, which has started back in 92, 93, um, has got eight, it's a family of funds, kind of eight areas it's covered. Climate finance is one, uh, no, climate change is one area out of eight. And now we are having the eighth replenishment, GF8, what we call. Uh, so the commitment is about uh, uh, 5.3 or $5.4 billion over a four year period. And climate finance co covers, you know, comments about uh, one-sixth of that 
money under the GF. So, but the GF has a provision of a stakeholder consultation in designing the projects for ensuring social and environmental safeguards. But in developing countries, you know, which are centralized and where democracy is not very matured, uh, those stakeholder consultations are not, not very effective. Okay. And then we have the uh, uh, Jeff, uh, a small grants program. Okay. This is something uh, which is uh, run by UNDP. Uh, there is some little opportunities for the local communities, but the fund is very, very small. In uh, Jeff 8, for example, total $155 million uh, for these whole areas. And the uh, for a maximum uh, claim a local community can uh, for uh, submitted proposals about $75 billion. Million. But FRS grants are about $25,000, uh, not $75,000. But for strategic uh, programs, there is provision of $150,000. But mm, uh, those strategic projects are very, very few. Overall, about $25,000 FRS grants, you know. Uh, are most in common is the mode. So uh, very, very little money. And mm, mm, there is also the program of uh, 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 kind of uh, small grants program, as I mentioned. Now let me go to the adaptation fund, which has been personalized in 2010. Okay. Uh, so adaptation fund is grant based, you know, uh, and uh, the money was supposed to come from the certified emissions reduction emissions trading, but because of uh, non-participation by America, uh, the uh, emissions trading was not very high. So out of about $1.8 billion so far in the adaptation fund, only about a little over $200 million was uh, from the certified emissions reduction because emissions trading was very weak and there were many, many loopholes um, initiated mostly in the European Union. Uh, but uh, adaptation fund has initiated one good thing in, since 2016 about EDA, what we call expedited direct access, where the, can't, the uh, uh, proponents, money comes to the national focal points, for example, uh, and mostly environment ministry or finance ministry. And here there is provision of uh, kind of uh, creation of uh, sub-grants for the local communities at sub-national levels, where local communities can come and little fund out of that uh, delivered to the country level programming. And that is one good thing in the adaptation finance. And uh, this kind of model uh, is replicated now uh, by the ZCF, Green Climate Fund, which has been operationalized in 2014-2015. But uh, the total portfolio, uh, we can see, is about $12 billion uh, committed. But the, uh, during the first replenishment period uh, uh, for four years, uh, 18, uh, 17 to 21, 22, about $10.3 billion. But at COP20, COP28, the second replenishment period had some better money, about $12.4 billion. But uh, in the GCF also, uh, GCF, you know, has got three windows. One is for mitigation, one is for adaptation and one is uh, uh, private sector facility. Private sector facility usually commands about one third of resources where there is provision of blended finance and also private entrepreneurship development and all those. Okay. Uh, but private sector money is not being utilized. There is not much uh, strong appetite uh, shown in the uh, for the private sector uh, facility fund, because private sector still largely takes climate change as kind of 
a, a loss uh, exercise, not kind of an opportunity for investments. Um, particularly for mitigation, private sector is relatively more weak because uh, uh, returns in, in mitigation can be measured and uh, kind of immediate uh, through decentralized, for example, renewable energy systems and all those. But for adaptation, private sector is very, very weak. About globally, about three to four percent of uh, climate finance is mobilized through uh, for adaptation uh, through private sectors. So this is very, very weak because adaptation is taken largely as a um, national uh, or local or uh, national public good, but benefits are uh, exclusive where private sector uh, puts money in. Uh, so uh, uh, in uh, in the uh, then we we can come to the uh, then now GCF also for example uh, is kind of piloting this expedited direct access. You know, four or five pilots have been initiated with $20 million each, where the uh, direct access entities or national access entities after getting money uh, has got the provision of uh, uh, devolution, some of its fund uh, through the uh, sub-national level, uh, community-based creation of a community-based fund like that. So gradually kind of this devolution from the multilateral agencies is taking place, but not uh, in a big way and with very, very small, small funds. So communities are not getting the benefit of this big money that we talk of billions of dollars. Then in adaptation funding, I have uh, forgotten to mention one thing. Uh, they have gotten an uh, APSIA program, uh, adaptation fund, Climate Innovation Accelerator. This is something good that uh, uh, organizations like MSC can you know, approach and uh, get funds for innovative programs. This is something that uh, we can think of mobilizing uh, for um, a small, as a small grants program uh, for innovative projects. And then uh, let me come to loss and damage fund, okay. Loss and damage fund, you know, had been uh, operationalized. At least a part was created at COP28 with about $800 million, which is again peanuts compared to the <laughs> mix of about five to six trillion dollars of uh, damaged uh, losses and damages. Uh, but at least one good thing that the fund has been established not yet operationalized, as you can see. World Bank has been agreed to serve as the interim trustee, but you know, World Bank has got a serious problem as far as it concerns uh, to reach out to the uh, local communities because multilateral system works intergovernmentally, either UN system or World Bank uh, system. So they cannot go directly to the local communities. They, their political partners are the national governments. Okay. So now we are expecting that locally led adaptation has been accepted globally under the now defunct uh, Global Commission on Adaptation uh, um, as one of the, their eight tracks. And many governments and international and national organizations have endorsed uh, these eight principles of LLA, which are excellent about reducing structural inequalities, but the most important one is decentralization of climate finance flows, devolution down the decision-making, as well as creation of funds at the local community level. And uh, if that can be, you know, uh, materialized, that can, those principles can be realized, that, uh, that will uh, do an excellent job to uh, empowering the local communities. Bangladesh government did not yet endorse those eight principles, but we are advocating that the government does uh, endorse the principles because Bangladesh has been regarded as a global model on um, uh, disaster management for decades. Now, uh, also Bangladesh is regarded as being, uh, started being regarded as a model of adaptation. So we hope that Bangladesh government 
will soon endorse these eight principles. And GCA, South Asia headquarter is in Dhaka. So that is also a good thing uh, that uh, to convince the government for endorsing this uh, 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 LLA principles. Now there is a serious problem with uh, uh, loss and damage fund. How to reach out to the local communities? Though developing countries all agreed that, okay, World Bank should serve as interim secretariat, but they have put 10 or 11 conditions to uh, be met by the World Bank in its functioning. So still not uh, the negotiation is over. Justice, uh, it has started at last COP. COP29 is going to be the COP of climate finance. So there uh, will be serious negotiations on how to really operationalize loss and damage fund, the first uh, frontline victims of which are the local communities. Now there is some progress in the uh, at least agreement. If you look at the GST, global stock take text, which is regarded as the cover decision. Okay. And there, um, still there is a, a provision for a stakeholder dialogue, including the local women communities and that, and uh, para 125, under the G, uh, loss and damage section, there is kind of an understanding that uh, planning will be initiated to initiate mechanisms of uh, devolution of climate finance down to the local communities. So in few years, we can see how World Bank you know, personalizes this kind of uh, devolved decentralized climate finance and uh, loss and damage financing, which can reach to the local communities. And my final point is about Global Shield. You know, Global Shield uh, as a new kind of, I feel it's kind of a, a re version of the global insu resilience, which had been working for the last few years. And at COP27, this Global Shield has been initiated under the leadership of the G7 countries, but Germany is the main leader with about uh, uh, um, committing about $200 million for the Global Shield, which is meant for mainly uh, insurance, a small and micro insurance to cover the smallholder farmers and the small and medium and um, uh, micro enterprises. These will be, this is under a personalization. <laughs> this can be, kind of a market-based business, model-based approach to uh, small and micro insurance. Because I personally don't believe in 100% uh, dole out, but this uh, policy premiums under these uh, micro and small insurance has to be subsidized by the international and national support. Because those communities are sheer victims of climate impacts, but at least for ensuring sustainable ownership, I believe that they also have to contribute a little. So this is what I wanted to share about these um, multilateral processes. Now, in terms of Bangladesh, what Azan mentioned, absolutely right, that in Bangladesh, microfinance is very, very active. You know, this Grameen Bank, Bank and NGO density in Bangladesh perhaps is the highest in the world. And that is one reason together with government's uh, you know, inclusive uh, policy framework and social big social protection programs, we uh, have reduced the kind of absolute poverty level. But relative poverty is increasing because of income disparity. Now, about this microfinance, there is a catch in the sense microfinance is mostly profit earning. Okay, and that is why Azan is absolutely right that they cover even the loaned out money through insurance. But once this created asset is lost by the communities from some extreme events, that lost assets are not covered by the microfinance credits. This is where there is a serious gap and where the communities, poor communities loses because the little asset that they uh, create out of the loans, but once some floods uh, wash away those assets, those microcredit financing institutions don't take responsibility because they have already covered almost of their financing through 
uh, insuring the loans. Okay, so this is something that we need to take care in our future planning and advocacy with these multilateral and bilateral agencies by the civil society organizations. Thank you very much. Uh, Graham, over to you. Thank you, Mizambai. That is just the most tremendous overview of what is a very complicated macro funding environment. Um, and I think you're very gentle on it because it, it really is struggling to uh, achieve relevance for adaptation and uh, in developing countries. Now, I know that CGAP is already talking to some of these funds uh, with a view to seeing what they can do to facilitate uh, particularly uh, microfinance, but perhaps also some, some insurance. And um, Sylvia is particularly well positioned to, uh, to guide us on, on that and the potential of uh, financial inclusion to play a role in adaptation. Sylvia, over to you. Thank you, Graham. Um, I hope you can see my screen and then I'll just make sure that I'm sharing also my sound because we'll have a nice video. Um, can you just give okay. brief feedback that you're seeing my screen? Yes. Perfect. Sorry. All right. Yeah, so uh, thanks a lot. And um, these have been very good um, insights already and, and contributions. And I will maybe um, reframe some of what we've already heard, um, but really picking up, first of all, on what we've heard um, from Arjan about how climate change is already impacting and, and particularly the most vulnerable populations. And um, as CGAP, which is a global think tank, um, that is focused on identifying new approaches for leveraging inclusive finance to achieve um, global development goals. We have really seen that climate change is very much impacting um, how financial services can contribute to um, helping people live better lives, build resilience, um, participate also in the green transitions and also to um, have a more equal world. And, and so we really wanted to understand better what is the, that opportunity for financial inclusion to support climate um, adaptation and resilience. So I just need to adjust something here. Okay. Um, so as you've heard um, from Arjan and also Mizan Bai um, briefly mentioned the role of financial services um, in supporting people as they um, in live increased impacts um, by climate change and also lift that change that is coming to their lives and their livelihoods and also the opportunities that are there in the transition to a green economy. And we think that uh, financial services have a very important role to play for helping them to take action on those things and to build resilience to climate risk, to adapt to the change, and also to seize the opportunities that are available. And this is because they really need um, access to savings. They need access to lending. They need access to payments um, or remittances um, or payments by a government. Um, and insurance products. Um, so the financial system plays a very important role and it also needs to be resilient to climate risks and also responsive to people's needs. And we've heard a little bit about the more government-led adaptation efforts that are really preeminent in, in climate adaptation, um, but also those require financial services because if we're talking about um, payments that are being done by governments or by public agencies um, before an event, maybe in preparation, but more uh, more frequent, um, more yeah, frequently as recovery payments. They require people to have access to accounts. They also require distribution networks where people can access that money. But we really think that there's a very good opportunity to leverage inclusive finance more to support the autonomous adaptation, meaning people's own resilience and adaptation strategies. 
Uh, we've heard that there's far more attention on, on land adaptation activities and um, Ms. Anbai has really elaborated a lot on the existing funds that tend to not be able to really deliver to um, communities. And so we think that there really needs to be much more research and um, testing of new approaches to enable that um, that adaptation at a local level. And we think that access to financial services can be very helpful in that. Because um, as we've seen in our research over decades on financial inclusion, that access to financial services is also very empowering. So it's not only having those financial services, it's also that effect on feeling more agency and feeling able to lead your own, um, your own livelihood and your own strategies. And Arjan also briefly mentioned um, that this is particularly important um, for women because women, they do face higher exposure to climate risk. Um, we've heard that before. Um, they are also typically more vulnerable to the impacts of those risks because they are the ones who are most um, affected by negative coping mechanisms like being taken out of school. Um, or eating less or needing to walk much further to get um, water, for example. Also more likely to suffer domestic violence as a result of the stress that um, uh, climate um, risks pose on a household, household. And they also tend to have lower access to the tools that are needed for adaptation and resilience. And that includes also financial services. At the same time, we also see that women... Um, represent an untapped potential for action on climate change. Um, they are often crucial to the resilience of the households and communities because they tend to invest more in health and education and in general in the needs of the families and of the communities um, as compared to men. And they are really the frontline actors on climate adaptation and mitigation, not only at the household level, but also at community levels. I want to. Um, illustrate a little bit the role of financial services and particularly for women um, with a short video. And I hope that um, this will work. Just give me a thumbs up, uh, maybe if you can hear the sound. પેલા તો અમે પશુ ને બહાર બાંધતા ત્યાં ખુલ્લા માં તે ઘડીએ વધારે ગંદકી થતી હતી અને અમારા ઢોર અડધા અડધા ગરકી જતા હતા અને ખાવામાં પણ બહુ તકલીફ થતી હતી થતું હતું ચાર પાંચ લીટર જેવું અત્યારે અમારે છ લીટર જેવું દૂધ ભરી શકીએ છીએ અમે Yeah, so that was a, a very brief um, demonstration. And um, unfortunately, though, even though we've seen that a loan can really help people, A, we're seeing that um, this potential is not yet really um, leveraged and realized sufficiently of financial services. And those type of financial services are not always available. We heard also from Ms. Ambai that a lot of uh, focus of the funding that comes um for climate adaptation is focused on debt. Now here we have a 0% loan, but how can that loan be provided at 0%? Um, and then obviously we also heard earlier from Arjan that other financial services like savings, like insurance, um, 
also need to be provided to people and, and really be designed in ways that they help them. And so we are seeing that there is still a lot of work needed to make financial services living up to that potential that they have on climate action. And um, one of the primary reasons why financial inclusion is not yet really realizing that potential is that we still don't have sufficient access to financial services amongst those that are most impacted by climate change. We know that 1.4 billion people are still financially excluded and 80% of them are living in the most climate vulnerable countries. Then the second problem is that financial services that people have access to are not always fit for that purpose. Um, as I mentioned, like there might be financial services available, but they really don't meet those needs and they are potentially far too expensive um, for people who are impacted by climate change to, to access them and to, to afford them. Um, we did a global scan of financial services and we did find that very few financial services providers are already offering products that are tailored to the climate adaptation and resilience needs of vulnerable and of low income customers. Uh, one product that did stand out was agricultural index insurance or climate index insurance, which has a very important uh, and also very useful function, but we see globally very limited uptake in usage of insurance products. And so um, we do need to respond much better to people's preferences and also to their needs. Then the third problem is that very few financial service providers actually see climate adaptation as a priority and even less so as a business opportunity. And I think that also came out from prior um, presentations. We did um, interviews with over 100 different financial service providers, including microfinance um, institutions, commercial banks, savings groups, insurers, reinsurers, fintech organizations, mobile money providers, also remittance providers. And by and large, we found that they have not made climate change a major priority. They have so many other fires to fight um, that climate change is something um, that they see as something that needs to wait and they can deal with later because they have to deal with inflation, with the economic crisis, in some cases with conflict. Um, so they're just other priorities. If they have any climate efforts, efforts, they tend to focus on two things, either on reducing their carbon footprint because they are corporate net zero goals or on analyzing their own climate risk exposure. And that can actually also have a negative effect because if they really analyze what is our exposure to climate change, they might end up withdrawing from regions or from segments that are exposed to climate risks and vulnerable to climate change. So we might actually have less financial service providers reaching out to populations that are impacted by climate change, but that need access to financial services in order to lead their autonomous adaptation strategies. Then lastly, we found that among all those providers that we interviewed, uh, microfinance providers stood out as being on the leading edge because they are typically more aware and also more concerned about the impacts on their clients. And they were also more likely to try to respond but they shared that what they are lacking is the expertise. They are not trained to understand climate risks and, and to be climate experts. Um, they lack skills and they lack the data as well um, to understand what is the vulnerability in a certain region. And they also lack access to risk tolerant financing so they can test new approaches and they can invest in climate adaptation and resilience. So these are the different ways by which inclusive finance is not yet living up to its potential on climate change. And what we need is really that the international development community and public actors invest more in financial systems that are inclusive and that are also resilient and responsive to climate risks. And for that, we have been trying to map out um, how funders and governments can respond to it. 
um, particularly by building financial systems. And we have been sketching this out um, across the different um, level of severity of the risk and the different level of vulnerability of the segment they are targeting. And so we are seeing in this area where we have smaller risks and higher income populations or less vulnerable populations, um, markets generally can offer relevant financial services um, because the risk is lower. And so here for governments and funders, it really means that they can focus on traditional market building efforts where they can drive the scale of such solutions, the use of, so, of solutions, and also cost efficiency in providing them. So this is kind of like classic um, development um, of markets. But then we're moving more into the middle area where we have um, growing risks, we have growing vulnerabilities of the people that are being targeted. And so the commercial viability of offering services that meet those adaptation and resilience needs will be much harder. And so we need the governments and, and development funders to really focus on de-risking the provision of those financial services and to share the cost of provisioning those financial services that are needed. And that is can be done by mobilizing private capital um, in order to get some more financing from the private sector. Um, and really making it less risky for private investors to come in and also to help extending the reach of market actors. And, and this touches very much on what we've heard earlier also from Arjan, where Arjan mentioned um, these different ways of blended finance to support climate adaptation and resilience. And um, he mentioned reducing the weighted average cost of capital. So that is a means um, allowing for the financial leverage and also to reducing risk. So that is very much in line with what was mentioned. But then we also heard from um, Professor Mizan that there are certain contexts where simply there, there, there's the private sector has no interest and, and there's not enough um, financing from the private sector. I think he shared an, an example also from the microfinance institutions in, in Bangladesh. And, and so we have this other area um, where really we have high risks, we have very vulnerable populations, and we see that there is really no, there's no business case for the private sector to offer services. And this is where the public sector really needs to step in and needs to cover for those losses um, of vulnerable households and businesses. And this is where loss and damage payments can come in, um, where social protection plays a very important role. Um, also public reinsurance and insolvency relief. And then obviously there's um, a question of like at what level would the public sector step in? Would it step in really at the individual level and support households and communities? There are a couple of um, emerging um, approaches to channeling um, money down to the local level, be it through social protection um, schemes where it's really being um, paid to individuals. And, and obviously here payments and payment systems play an important role. Um, but there are also um, examples like UNCDF's local um, approach, which channels payments through local governments um, to communities. Um, and I, I think there's really an opportunity to um, scale some of those solutions to um, channel finance down to the local levels. But let me briefly summarize now the key um, takeaways from our research. And I think that's also a nice summary of what we've heard um, overall from, um, from the presenters. Um, so the first is that financial inclusion is a key enabler of climate adaptation. Um, and um, and especially for locally led adaptation, but there's still a lot that we don't know and there's not enough happening yet. Um, the needs of women need to take center stage in this because of the compounding inequities and also their role in household resilience. Um, climate change is also poised to push financial inclusion back. So we have to be very careful about it. And, um, need to help clients and also providers better manage their climate risk. 
And then public finance really is critical to go out in capital and build markets, but also to directly support vulnerable people and to manage, um, to, uh, to help vulnerable people and businesses to manage climate risk. And based on those insights, we are proposing an agenda um, for research and action, and not only for the financial inclusion sector, but really in very close partnership with the climate sector, the, um, the disaster risk management sector, and other adjacent sectors, including also social protection. And these are centered around um, five broad components. Um, the first one is that we really need to work harder to really understand what is it that customers and particularly women really need um, to bolster their climate resilience and to adapt to climate change. We need to do more work in developing financial products and services that really respond to those needs and that are commercially viable and build markets that can deliver them. We need to help financial service providers to manage their own climate risk. So to avoid that they have to withdraw from climate exposed sectors and, um, and uh, segments. And we need to work more on what is it that makes a policy and regulatory framework um, inclusive, but also fit to unlock private investment for climate adaptation while avoiding unintended exclusionary effects that would undermine inclusion and also stability. And then we're seeing also a very important area of research around social protection systems, as I mentioned, how can these really support a individuals in building resilience, but also to Adapt, um, help them adapt to climate change and be much more um, supportive of long-term um, and slow onset climate if, events. Um, so let me stop here and um, maybe just briefly share um, that there are a couple of um, resources if you're interested to learn more on ccap.org slash climate um, where you can find all of those. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Sylvia. And, and let me just quickly endorse those publications. Um, they really are outstanding and I think very, very valuable. Um, so let me now open it up to questions. This, I think, is a, a fairly unique opportunity for people to quiz some of the leading experts on this topic. Um, and so I would invite you to uh, fire away with questions. Samvit uh, Sahu, I think you had a question in the Q&A. Would you like to voice it over quickly? Samvit, are you there? Ah, Samvit doesn't have access. OK. Um, so let, let me go to Patok. Uh, can you voice over your question, or are we not? Are, are they all muted? Hi, am I audible, Graham? Yes, perfect. Off you go. So I think I there, there was a question I posted to Sylvia. If there is a question to Sylvia that you are seeing in the Q and A section. Yeah. Yeah. So succinct summary of the yes. question, please. So my question to uh, CGAP is that, uh, is there a plan to advocate for adaptation finance taxonomies that are well articulated in a, in a lucid manner to financial institutions so that they can understand what adaptation finance uh, means actually? Because current uh, adaptation finance taxonomies addresses uh, the scientific community well, but it is not well understood by uh, you know, financial service providers. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for that question. So first, uh, very briefly, we are not planning to develop um, template taxonomies. The challenge with adaptation finance is that it's very context specific, right? So 
it's very difficult to develop a generic set of adaptation activities that would then uh, be eligible for adaptation finance. Um, we are seeing that that is also one of the major challenges that funders are facing in defining what is adaptation finance. Um, what we will likely be doing is through our research also directly with providers that we will identify what are some of the examples in a specific given context of financial services that support the adaptation of their customers. And so we will rather develop some specific examples, but we will not go as far as developing uh, taxonomies. However, maybe based on that work that we will be doing um, with financial so, uh, service providers um, and also the investors, we might be able to help in those cases better understand um, each other between a, a, an investor that has financing that is tagged as climate um, and the provider to be more like aligned in, in how this is being interpreted. And I hope that from some of those engagements, um, investors specifically can better understand how to really be very cognizant of like, helping the provider understand what they mean and then also adjusting it much more to what can be done on the ground so that this dialogue is happening. And hopefully um, through that community of practice that we are putting in place between financial service providers and also investors, they can share some of those insights and um, also examples. Thank you, Silvia. Great. Thanks, Pato. Do you want to lower your hand? And then I think Samvit has sorted out his technical issues. Hi, thanks uh, for the great presentation. And thanks, Ms. Andrei, for uh, the wonderful question. A wonderful presentation and you know, sharing a macro level view. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, so, uh, uh, because ICAD you know, involves and engages a lot with the local communities. So how can actually we actively engage uh, with this local community and taking their opinion in shaping and executing climate uh, adaptation financial strategies so that you know we understand that their uh, priorities and needs are at the top. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think the question is directed to me. Okay. Yes, Ms. Yeah. You know, we at ICAD, at Independent University of Bangladesh, we are, are a kind of ICAD, kind of is a do and think tank, what we call. We are not big implementers. We uh, implement little, little projects, the purpose of which is mainly to build capacity to raise awareness of the communities. Uh, uh, and then we work with the communities for capacity building mainly at different levels, uh, starting from local up to national levels. And ICAD has got many formal agreements with uh, different ministries and agencies. Uh, what we do with the communities is to look at the uh, kind of uh, their vulnerabilities in terms of adaptation, uh, what are they doing for adaptation? What are the limits of adaptation? Now a focus at ICAD is more on loss and damage. And you know, loss and damage starts where adaptation you know, uh, faces limits. And our now purpose is to generate evidence base for loss and damage so that we can highlight globally uh, that these communities need support from the loss and damage fund, as well as from adaptation fund and other international sources. Okay. Thank you so much, Mizambai. I, I do think also implicit in Samvit's question is, is the challenge that you and I discussed the other day with your outstanding team in terms of how do we get to a stage where we can en engage local communities uh, at scale because uh, there's there's such a challenge with with lots and lots and lots of piecemeal local adaptation planning and bringing them together 
um, and 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 you know, will we have time to do that before we run out of out of time as the climate crisis unfolds? Um, next up, we have a, a, a question from Greta. Um, sorry, Petra, and um, Petra, I wondered if you could voice it over. Are you with us, Petra? So I'll voice it for you if I may quickly. Linking the second and third presentation, how can the World Bank or CGAP support the trend of more climate finance becoming available for inclusive financial services to support locally led adaptation? Sylvia, that sounds like uh, Good question for me, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, first of all, for CGAP, right, our role is also to be a think tank and do tank, um, but maybe much focused on financial inclusion. And so our role we see really in um, really realizing some of that research that I lined out at the end, um, where I shared like what is kind of the research agenda where we need to do more. And we're already working on all of those five um, different aspects. So really understanding what are um, good ways for financial service providers to better manage climate risks, how can also policymakers respond to that and build an enabling regulatory environment um, exploring how social protection can be designed in ways to um, support the adaptation of um, climate vulnerable populations, um, and then also really um, increasing understanding of the needs of customers. Um, and then what we are doing as well is mapping out the different ways for funders of different types, meaning multilateral funders like the World Bank, um, or the Asian Development Bank or African Development Bank, um, as well as bilateral funders or then um, um, DFIs and impact investors, uh, as well as philanthropies. How can they really support the development of an inclusive financial system that is responsive and resilient to climate uh, adaptation needs? And so there we are um, looking at a those donors that support at a policy level can really support everything that um, needs to be in place for a financial system to function and to be inclusive. Um, that's very much of the work that we've done over the past decades, um, really defining what um, are the different in in infrastructure pieces that need to be in place to enable payments to be channeled to individuals and to be accessible in safe and convenient uh, ways, what our infrastructure needs um, to also just make finance available. Um, and also then like, what is the policy environment to ensure responsible delivery for financial services? Um, and then also what are the different support functions for a financial service provider to offer those financial services? So that is very much where um, the donors come in because they can help developing this um, financial system or financial market system. Um, but then when we have uh, DFIs and uh, investors, they can really focus more on de-risking. Um, sorry, I mean impact investors that have also a social mission. Um, it's really about like de-risking um, where there are new solutions, supporting maybe with innovation grants, um, the development of a new product um, or an existing product, but that can be a adapted to really serve the resilience and adaptation needs. But there's a lot of de-risking needed, uh, just like a first loss capital or um, offering a certain contingent credit line or offering some sort of guarantee that comes in when a devastating event hits, let's say, a microfinance institution, right? Um, where a microfinance institution might see a tremendous loss in their um, portfolio. And so there's a guarantee that can back that up. Or they support, as Dr. Mizan mentioned, they might support premiums for insurance products, right? Where um, uh, the insurance product might become more affordable either for the individual or also for a financial service provider. So there were very different ways for um, funders to support. And I try to 
distinguish a little bit with that graph that I was showing how that might differ depending on what type of you are targeting and what type of severity of a financial risk. And we will be doing more on that. So stay tuned. Um, we'll hopefully be publishing something within the next couple of months. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Sylvia. Uh, Mizambai, you have your hand up. So I'm sure yeah. we will. Just I, just I want, to, want to add what Sylvia has mentioned. A very good point. Just I think uh, the poor communities, you know, we need to think of how to scale uh, access of the poor communities to banking, formal banking services. Because in our countries, banks still supply about two thirds of development finance uh, because the secondary market, capital market is not developed. A poor doesn't have any access. Okay. So this is one thing that we need if we want to empower the local communities, poor communities, and also the financial literacy. For example, the micro insurance, the small insurance, people are still are not aware. So this financial literacy is something very, very important. We have to work with to kind of scale a business model of a micro kind of uh, insurance or whatever uh, kind of cushion systems we build for them. Okay, thank you. Absolutely agree with all of that, uh, Mizanbai. And um, and and I, I go back to that slide that uh, um, Arjan showed with the three circles showing about talking about de-risking and reducing weight of uh, cost of uh, capital and and so on. Those are the instruments. And and in some respects, if we're going to stretch those very very limited funds that the multilateral institutions have. Uh, I think there's a big role that they could play in using those blended finance instruments, um, because otherwise there's a very real risk, as uh, Sylvia said, that the existing financial service providers will actually withdraw from climate affected areas because the risk is too high. So we're going to need to find ways of reducing that risk in one form or other. Um, and 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 certainly um, insurance uh, may be may be one key opportunity there as well. So I think lots to think about in that context. Um, we have another question from Wahid Robin, and he is asking, and I think this is for you, Mizambai, how can the capacity of local government be uh, improved to uh, for better practice of locally-led adaptation? Yeah, thank you. Yes, in locally-led adaptation, Local government is the uh, most important actor because they have the power, political power, administrative power. And why local leader adaptation kind of has become a mantra of adaptation engineering now? Because earlier we had for the 10, 15 years, community-based adaptation, which has proved its efficacy. There is no question about its uh, efficacy now, but why it did not uh, scale up? Because government was not a party to that. As, and I already mentioned that intergovernmental system, in intergovernmental system, um, national governments are the partners of uh, multilateral agencies, bilateral agencies. That is why locally led adaptation of local government is a prime actor. Now we need to build capacity of local government officials. For example, in Bangladesh, we have a local government engineering department, which has got access to the farthest corner of Bangladesh. Now, most of their staff uh, are um, engineers. Okay. Now, engineers prefer building up buildings, for example, building up infrastructures. But for adaptation uh, of, of the local communities, we need to build more of soft adaptation skills. Okay, soft adaptation tools, for example, like this capacity building, awareness raising, financial literacy, then insurance, the, uh, et cetera. And that is where we need to work with the local government officials for training them, constant training, because those officials are also transferable. But more uh, important is to work 
at the local government level with elected representatives. In Bangladesh, for example, we have at the sub-district level, we have uh, Upozila, okay, in between Union Council, the lowest of government and the district level. So this we have Upozila chairman, for example, sub-district level elected chairman, vice chairman, and a council, and also elected uh, chairman of the local union uh, councils. Okay, and they are they will stay there uh, continuously. They live there, so they have experiential uh, experiences, experiential learning based on uh, decades of their staying there. So we need to. They are part of the local government. So we need also to work with them more in that sense because they can suggest sustainable solutions. They have better wisdom than this transferable job, you know, local government officials who are not sons of that soil and they are transferred every two, three years. So we need to focus together with government officials, more of local uh, elected representatives, both community and civil society leaders, as well as the local private sector. Because we focus in developing countries in Bangladesh, for example, we focus more on big business houses, Dhaka-based chambers, we do dialogue with Dhaka-based chambers, but we need to initiate dialogues on local private sector communities of micro and uh, medium and uh, small sized enterprises, which contributes more than 25% of GAD, GDP in Bangladesh and which contributes or absorbs more than 70% of our labor force. Okay, so we need you know, to work with local private sector more. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Mizanbai. Sylvia, you have your hand up? Yeah, maybe just before we close, I want to add one thing that I think is really important because we focus a lot about talking about climate finance and this is all about the money and how can the money trickle down to the bottom of the pyramid and the most vulnerable. But obviously, um, it also requires people access to the solutions, the technology, the information, the skills that they need in order to build resilience and adapt. And so it's very important that we also start collaborating more with people who work on those type of solutions and also funders need to support the building of markets that allow access to those type of solutions, right? It's not only about the money, it's also about the solutions. So I just wanted to point that out more. And this is also an area that we are trying to um, explore and, and identify good practice solutions of how those um, different actors can come together to build not only the financial market, but also the markets of the solutions and of the capacity building and of the information, how that information can be shared and accessible to, to all sectors. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Sylvia. And I absolutely agree. Um, and, and of course, I think that we are going to have to use sort of catalytic agents of change um, to facilitate that, that process. And that won't just be uh, NGOs, but it could actually even be extensions of uh, financial service providers and, and so on. Um, and I put a, a link to a, a little blog um, in the chat on exactly that uh, that role uh, and crossover between financing and digital technologies. So I'd encourage people to take a look at that. Arjun, I feel that you should have the last word because you have been outside the conversation since your excellent introduction. So uh, over to you to wrap us up. Yes, thank you so much. I think uh, this has been a very wonderful presentation. I just wanted to say um, three things in respect to um, locally led adaptation and, and being able to fund it. Um, I think we do need a step change in planning um, and planning at the local level um, and how we facilitate local governments to be able to robustly and effectively plan for climate risks and identify climate solutions is going to be very, very critical. And I don't see enough investments and effort in, in these kinds of, of planning efforts um, I think it's very positive that, you know, at the national level, the UNFCC has mandated all countries to develop national adaptation plans, but uh, they need to trickle down very quickly to the local level. Um, so that was the first point. The second point, I think, is this focus on, on decentralization and building the capacity of local governments, of inclusive financial institutions, and of 
Um, civil society to be able to manage funds at the local level for adaptation is very, very important. Uh, and I think um, the last part is that we need to ensure that the digital revolution doesn't leave behind the people at, at the bottom, um, that they are able to use digital tools to improve their planning, their ability to identify resources, as well as their ability to improve their own lives. So that was all from my side. Thank you, Graham. Super, great summary. And with that, just one minute over the, over the line, we should perhaps uh, close it up. Let me thank our three panelists, um, Arjun, uh, Mizanbay, and uh, Sylvia for what I think was a really, really Good discussion, and thank you so much for your time, particularly perhaps uh, Sylvia, who who could be on the ski slopes right now if it wasn't for the, her sitting in front of the camera. So thank you all so much, and um, may may we all see the results of this discussion um, ensure much better flows to support locally led adaptation. Thank you, and bye bye. <laughs>